رسول الله حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa al-aqibatu lil muttaqin ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My dear beloved brothers and sisters, welcome to another live edition of your program Gardens of the Pious. This is an episode number 174 by the grace of Allah. Uh, we'll continue to explain chapter number 41. That is going to be the third episode in explaining this chapter, which is known as تحريم العقوق. The prohibition of being undutiful to one's parents and the severance of ties of kinship. The hadith which you're about to study is a very interesting hadith, hadith number 337, narrated by the great companion Abdullah, the son of Amr ibn al As. May Allah be pleased with him and his father. عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الكبائر الإشراك بالله وعقوق الوالدين وقتل النفس واليمين الغموس رواه البخاري. In this hadith, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, major sins are to ascribe partners to Allah, disobey parents, murder innocent person, and to take a false oath. Intentionally, <coughs> collected by Imam Al Bukhari. Obviously, Amr ibn Al As radiyallahu anh is one of the great companions whom we admire and we revere, and we send the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and upon his family members and upon his great companions. And Abdullah, the son of Amr ibn Al As, was also a great companion. He is the one who used to write down. Uh, whenever he was young and a teenager, he would write down the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So uh, the elders from Quraysh forbade him and said, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a human being. Sometimes he says things whenever he's angry, uh, he does not necessarily mean it may not be a wahi. So you should not write down everything he says, not to confuse it with the wahi, with the revelation. So he ceased from writing. Then one day he came to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he told him the story. He said, "I used to write down whatever you used to say of the hadith, but Quraysh stopped me from doing so." The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered him to resume writing down his sunnah. And he said, "Oktob, I swear to the one who sent me the truth, nothing comes from between my lips but the truth." وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ The Prophet ﷺ said, Resume writing by Allah. Nothing comes from between my lips but the truth. And Allah said in Surah Al-Najm, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, doesn't utter a word on his own, from his own whim. But rather it is only a revelation that has been revealed unto him. صلى الله عليه وسلم and obviously all Egyptians owe Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu an uh, being Muslims today. He is the one who introduced Islam to Egypt. May Allah be pleased with him. Imagine all those people who have accepted Islam and who are currently Muslims and who will become Muslims in the soil until the Day of Judgment will come in the scale of the good deeds of Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu an. Why am I saying this? We all know that. We all know that. لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمْرٍ نَعْمٍ 
if Allah guides through you one person, that is more than enough for you, that is better than the red camels, that is better than the whole world and what it contains. Imagine when you are a cause and a mean of guidance of a whole nation, like Egypt. Egyptian people were similarly idolaters because they were divided between uh, Pharaonic people who used to worship idols and Romans who also practiced paganism because bound down to other than Allah the Almighty, whether it's a human being or a statue or an idol, is an act of disbelief. So in this mass of people back then, then generations after generations, mashallah, 1400 years now, all those people who have accepted Islam mainly because of him. So may Allah be pleased with him. His son Abdullah said, I, uh, he narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, among the major sins, why did we say among the major sins, even though the hadith says, Al-Kaba'iru, Al-Kaba'ir, but we know that from the previous hadith, that in uh, some other hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned more than three major sins. In one hadith he says, avoid the seven destructive sins, so there are seven. And in other hadith, he also mentioned uh, some major sins which were not mentioned in this hadith, such as when he was reclining, then he sat up and he continued saying, ala wa qawlu zur, ala wa qawlu zur, many times, right? So now we understand that the three major sins in this hadith are not all the major sins, rather among the major sins, then he mentioned three. If the Prophet ﷺ were to speak about any major sins, there comes number one of the major sins, shirk. Associating partners to Allah in worship, because this is the most dangerous. While the rest of the major sins are subject for forgiveness, that is the only sin which there is no way that a person who dies in a state of disbelief, or while associating partners to Allah in worship, may gain forgiveness, may gain forgiveness. Because Allah the Almighty says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Verily, Allah does not forgive that a person may associate partners to him in worship, or ascribe other deities with him in worship. وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ And he forgives other sins for whomever he was. Uh, this is ayah number 48 of Surah An-Nisa. Following that, there is another ayah which provides the same meaning. Also, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءَ It's like Allah confirming this matter. So he listed number one, الكبائر الإشراك بالله Ascribing partners to Allah in worship. The second, being undutiful to both parents or whoever is living of them. Being undutiful to them verbally, by action, or by negligence, because maybe you're not saying a bad word to them. But meanwhile, you're not fulfilling your duty to them. You're not serving them as it should be. وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّانِ صَغِيرًا Not praying for them is considered as being not dutiful to them. So imagine how many times we remember to pray for our children, for our wives, for our businesses, for our health, you know. And how many times on the other hand you remember to make dua for your parents. For those who neglect making dua for their parents, this is a form of uquq or being undutiful to them. And Allah the Almighty says the word, the utterance of the term of, which is not even a word, it's a motion. That is considered a major sin. And the third is nafs, killing or taking the life of an innocent person. Allah the Almighty says in Surah An-Nisa, وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فجزاؤه جهنم خالدا فيها وغضب الله عليه ولعنه وأعد له عذابا عظيما 
Imagine how many warnings against taking the life of an innocent person. Some people take it very lightly to take the lives of innocent people simply because they were commanded to do so by their superior. This is their source of income. This is how they make their living. So it becomes for them like a piece of cake. Allah says in these warnings, whosoever kills a single believer deliberately, muta'amidan, his recompense will be as follows. Number one, Jahannam. What is Jahannam? The hellfire. Oh, okay. Well, the Jews says, لَن تَمَسَّنَا النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا even if we enter far, we're going to be there for a few days, seven days, and we'll come out of it. Listen to this. جهنم خالدا فيها الخلود eternity. So he will be thrown in hell forever to abide therein eternally. Those who kill their own citizens, those who kill their own people. Uh, for a competition over rulership, kingship, presidency, you know, I don't know what you're fighting for. Sooner or later, you're going to meet your Lord. You're going to sit on a throne, but in hell, taking the life of a single believer, of a single mu'min, will make you doomed to hell forever. Khalidan fiha. Number one, this is not the only torment. Number two, وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ And Allah's wrath is upon him. وَلَعَنَهُ And Allah curses him. وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا And his torment, Allah has prepared for him a very huge torment in hell. May Allah protect us. You know, the demolition of the Kaaba, which is the most sacred building for Muslims, is a lot easier than shedding the blood of a single Muslim. Just a reminder. Obviously, those who are involved in taking the lives of innocent people are negligent of that. They are negligent of the fact that soon they will die. And soon they will be questioned. And soon they will face the reality that their superior, who ordered them to pull the trigger, or to bombard the innocent people. Imagine when Syria, this uh, war criminal, this tyrant, who is killing his own people, Muslim innocent people, men, women, children, and elders and all of that, mass killing every day on a regular basis. And there are some muftis and there are some sheikh who line up with him and they appear with him in, uh, you know, religious occasions, in religious holidays, to so pray Eid and, and so on. On the day of judgment, it will not be, uh, they will not have any excuse, they cannot say, إِنَّ أَطَعْنَا سَادَتَنَا وَكُبَرَاءَنَا فَأَضَلُّونَ السَّبِيلَ our Lord, we only obeyed the orders of our superiors, of our leaders, of our masters, of our chiefs. And they misled us to say, that's not an excuse. The superior, the leaders, are going to hell anyway because making the order. They did not carry out the mission of killing the innocent people. But they passed the orders to those who executed the order. They will disown them. We're free from your sin. We didn't tell you to do anything. You're entirely responsible. Ah. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا Now the follower who blindly followed orders. They say, لَوْ أَنَّ لَنَا كَرَّةً فَنَتَبَرَّأَ مِنْهُمْ كَمَا تَبَرَّأُوا مِنَّا We wish we have an opportunity, a chance to disown them as they disowned us. كَذَلِكَ يُرِيهِمُ اللَّهُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ حَسَرَاتٍ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ Both the followers and those whom they followed will not come out of hell. وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ We're repeating this ayat so those who are being negligent or may not know should be aware of the fact that أحصاه الله ونسو if you think that after all you can perform Hajj or Umrah and you'll be forgiven and you can start a new page in your dreams in your dreams when 
الحجاج ابن يوسف الثقفي هو was a big time criminal he was a governor appointed by one of the Umayyad caliphs but he was criminal he killed a lot of innocent people when he came to kill the last person that he murdered سيدنا سعيد ابن جبير may Allah be pleased with him and he was a great scholar there was a very interesting dialogue between this tyrant perpetrator and criminal and this great companion the tabi'i he was a companion of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ he was a master of at tabi'in the followers of the companions he said I'm gonna take your life he said well you're going to ruin my life and that would ruin your hereafter so what is the maximum you can do you're not gonna make my life short if you take my life today anyway I was going to die today if you did not kill me if you did not shoot me if you did not starve me to death I was gonna die today anyway but since you are the one who executed this that would ruin your hereafter okay and I'm happy when Qabil came to kill Habil Habil said لَإِنْ بَسَطْتَ إِلَيَّ يَدَكَ لِتَقْتُلَنِي مَا أَنَا بِبَاسِطِ يَدِي إِلَيْكَ لِأَقْتُلَكَ if you stretch out your hand to kill me, I ain't gonna do the same. He is capable to defend himself. He was capable to kill Qabil. And he was righteous to the point that he said, I'm not gonna treat you the same. Why? Inni akhafu Allah Rabbal Alameen. Ah, that is the reason why we do not kill. Even though we are capable to kill. But we are capable to kill our oppressors but because we fear Allah the Lord of everything that exists then he said inni uridu an tabu'a bi ismi wa ismika fatakuna min ashab al-nar wa dhalika jaza'u al-zalimin for me I want you to bear my sin and your sin accordingly you will dwell eternally in hell and this is the recompense of the wrongdoers he continued to do what he planned and he killed his brother what did Habil say? I'm not gonna do the same to you because I fear Allah. And if you kill me, you're gonna bear my sin and your sin. Those who have been killed while they were innocent, Allah the Almighty will forgive them their sins. They are martyrs, they are shuhada, they will be admitted to paradise, they will get to intercede for 70 of their family members, while their murderers, those who took their lives, they will live in misery in this life. Wallahi, they will live in misery in this life. And even when they die, whether they die a natural death or they're killed or they end up taking their lives, they will experience the worst return. As Allah Almighty says, فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا May Allah guide us and protect us against these evil and heinous crimes. Then he said, now how many major sins the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in this hadith, Al-Ishraq wa Bila, Uquq al-Walidayn, Qatb al-Nafs, the fourth and the last in this hadith is, Wal-Yameen al-Ghamus, and Al-Ghamus oath, what is Al-Yameen al-Ghamus, which is to take a false oath intentionally. As we explained earlier many times that Al-Yameen, which is an oath, a confirmation of your statement by saying, I swear to Allah, or any of his names or any of his attributes, that is categorized into three categories. The first is Yaminun Munaqida, second, Lal, third, Ghanus. Al Yaminun Munaqida, which means a confirmed oath. The person uh, swears to Allah, takes an oath to Allah, whether to do or to not to do anything in the future. So he is capable whether to do it or not to do it. And that's why he confirmed his statement by saying, Wallahi, somebody says, Wallahi, I should stop smoking and this is the last cigarette to smoke. I'm, I'm not going to smoke anymore. So this is called Yaminun Munaqida, a confirmed oath. And somebody says, I swear to Allah, I ain't talking to my brother anymore. That's also Yamin al Munaqida. He, he promised and he swore to Allah not to talk to his brother, not to visit him, not to accept his uh, visit, not to talk to him over the phone. But the difference 
between the two cases is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith man ra'a man halafa ala yameenin faraa ghayraha khayran minha falyati alladhi allati ya khayr wal yukaffir an yameenin which means when somebody takes an oath to do anything or as we said not to do anything then he realizes that his oath was wrong he was not supposed in the first place to make this promise and this is wrong like the later case when he says i swear not to talk to my brother or to boycott my sister or not to pray in this masjid or not to do a good deed so he realized that he was wrong what is the alternative is to break his oath for a good thing yes then do it فَلْيَأْتِ الَّذِي هِيَ خَيْرٌ Let him do what is better. وَلْيُكَفِّرْ عَنْ يَمِينِهِ What is the meaning of فَلْيُكَفِّرْ عَنْ يَمِينِهِ وَلْيَأْتِ الَّذِي هِيَ خَيْرٌ To give a kafara, a ransom. Because he confirmed his oath by saying wallahi. And this is no play. You are saying wallahi. And Allah's name is the greatest. And when you take his name in your oath, this is a mean of confirming your oath and a sign of belief in that of believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who's worthy of worship. That's why he said, Wallahi. And that's why you're not allowed to swear to other than Allah. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in the sound hadith, Man kana halifan billahi aw yasmut. Let whoever takes an oath to swear to Allah or to be quiet. So swearing to your grandmother life to your father's grave, to anything that is valuable in your life is not permissible. The Prophet ﷺ perceived such oath as a form of shirk. When you swear, you should only swear to Allah the Almighty. And Allah the Almighty says in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَلَا تَجَعَلُوا اللَّهَ عُرْضَةً لِأَيْمَانِكُمْ أَن تَبَرُّوا وَتَتَّقُوا وَتُصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ What does it mean? Al-Urda is an obstacle. So do not make your oath like an obstacle on the way or again is doing something which is good such as an tabarru wa tattaqu wa tuslihu bayna an-nas to do what is good, to uphold the ties of kinship and to reconcile between people. Like what? The example I gave. Somebody is having a problem or a conflict with his relative or one of his relatives, a brother, a sister, so says, Wallahi, I'm not going to talk to you forever. I uh, says, you know what, had it not been for my oath, because I said, Wallahi, you know, I wanted to talk to him, I wanted to resume talking to him, but I said Allah. So Allah said, no, 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 no. Do not make Allah as an obstacle on the way of making good deeds, doing better. Reconciling between people. So what should we do? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, in this case, do the kafara, the ransom, and do what is better. Do what is better. Resume doing what is better. Break your oath. What is the ransom? Surah Al-Ma'idah says, وَلَكِ يُؤَخِذُكُمْ بِمَا عَقَدْتُمُ الْأَيْمَانَ فَكَفَّارَتُهُ إِطْعَامُ عَشَرَةِ مَسَاكِينَ مِنْ أَوْسَطِ مَا تُطْعِمُونَ أَهْلِيكُمْ أَوْ كِسْوَتُهُمْ أَوْ تَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَ so the kafara for al yameen which is described as munaqida. Either to feed ten poor people, or to clothe them, or to free a slave neck. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامِ If the person is poor, cannot afford feeding or clothing ten poor people, then the alternative is to fast for three days and it doesn't have to be consecutive. ذَلِكَ كَفَارَةُ أَيْمَانِكُمْ إِذَا حَلَفْتُمْ وَحْفَظُوا أَيْمَانَكُمْ نعم So this is الْيَمِينُ الْمُنْعَقِدَى and we learn why is it مُنْعَقِدَى and what is its ransom in case that you have to uh, break it and whether it is better to keep it or break it should you make an oath to commit a sin or not to do an obedience What about الْيَمِينُ الْغَمُوسِ الْيَمِينُ الْغَمُوسِ is one of the major sins which was equated in the hadith mentioned along with shirk and being undutiful to one's parents and killing, deliberate killing of innocent people, taking the lives. And al al ghamuz that means it's such a, a very grave sin. Yes, indeed it is. Why? Because you think that you're belittling Allah's name. You think that Allah is not seeing you. 
He think that Allah is not aware of your intent and your falsehood. When you deliberately swear to Allah to prove to people that you did not do something which you actually did. And you swear to Allah lying deliberately. Why knowing? Okay, that's called Yameen. But why is it Ghamus? When you dip your finger or a bite or a bread in a glass or the plate until it's completely soaked. You dip it completely inside the vessel. That's called Ghams. Ghams. In the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that on the Day of Judgment, Allah will bring the most distributed person on earth. And he will immerse him in paradise once. So this person in dunya, he was the most misfortunate person. Uh, the most suffering person. Then on the Day of Judgment, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will order the angels to put him in heaven once. That's called immersing. Like he enters it wholly. Then he will take him out of it and say, my servant, have you ever experienced any suffering, any adversity or any hardship in your life? He was the person who suffered most in this life, but he was a believer. So when he made it to Al Jannah for a few minutes, then he was taken out and Allah asked him this question. He says, وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ أَنَا فِي النَّعِيمِ مُنذُ خَلَقْتَنِي I swear to your honor and majesty, I have been enjoying my life since you created me. I do not recall nor remember any suffering whatsoever. غَمْسَة غَمْسَة الْيَمِينُ الْغَمُوسِ is when the person deliberately immerses himself in fire. He chooses to enter fire without a ransom. Why? Because he had the guts to say, Wallahi, lying knowingly and deliberately. That's why it's called Ghamus. Because it doesn't have any kafara. Oh, can I fast for three days? Can I feed a hundred miskeen instead of ten? Because I appeared in court and I said, I swear to Allah this car is mine. And it is not yours. I swear to Allah I saw this man accepting bribery. And he's an innocent person. I swear to Allah, I saw this woman committing adultery. And she wasn't. And you just wanted to topple people. You were hired or out of envy or out of hatred. You lied against other people to ruin their life. To make their life miserable. Some people get killed. Some people lose their lives as a result of a fake oath. Accordingly, this Yameen is known as Yameen al Ramus. And it doesn't have any ransom. Bad luck. If you have the gods to play games with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there is an entry without exit, entry to Allah. لِأَنَّهَا تَغْمِسُ صَاحِبَهَا فِي النَّارِ Because it immerses the person who does so in hell. May Allah protect us against is that. They were the four major sins which have been mentioned in this hadith. The second in order after associating partners to Allah in worship was indeed being undutiful to one's parents. We'll take a short break. We'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Rasulallah, Habiballah. Rasulallah, Habiballah. Allah, Allah. So let me stray. Please come away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk on your favorite channel, Huda TV. I'm your host, Arkham Rashid. They actually did uh, such and such that you're accusing him of in your mind. Uh, so now I want to start off with my right hand side, uh, Brother Ahmed. If you can just tell us what your thoughts were on that video, what can you extract from that video? Would you say some of the youth uh, turn to drugs, especially you know in your country, if if they don't have jobs or you know it's because they want to get away from their daily normal lives would you say that's okay, a reason absolutely that? that's true some yes. people just resort to drug as the last option because they, they get themselves straight out and they're instead of depression but they don't know where to turn for help sports per se is like a, a communal social activity whereas mm -hmm. it, it, it collects the community together and it, it bonds 
brotherhoods together, you know. Yeah. It's it's very social in its aspect where you interact with you know, your teammates or your players in a team. So I think um, a message would be just to stay completely away, away from, from it. it. Even we can say, oh, look, it's haram. Commercials motivate viewers into immediate action and to sway consumer loyalty from one brand or service to the other. That's why we're here for you to help you sell your products and services by using creative ideas that bring life into your own TV commercial. Advertise your business and branded products and services on Huda TV. We will offer you fast paced and energetic 30 second affordable TV spots. Advertise on Huda TV, acquire fresh customers, and stay within your budget. For more info or to receive a quote, please send your inquiries to Advertise. Advert at Huda TV. Huda TV. Rasulallah, Habiballah. Rasulallah, Habiballah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. As usual, a quick reminder with our phone numbers: Area code zero zero two zero two three eight triple five two four nine. Alternatively, area code 002 zero zero two zero double one two five double zero eight six seven nine, and uh, email address is gardens at huda dot tv. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a live uh, edition, though. Uh, the hadith that we're studying now, inshallah, is hadith number three hundred uh, thirty-eight. The hadith is also narrated by the same narrator of the previous hadith, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al As. رضي الله عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من الكبائر شتم الرجل والديه قالوا يا رسول الله وهل يشتم الرجل والديه قال نعم يسب أبا الرجل فيسب أباه ويسب أمه فيسب أمه متفق عليه وفي رواية إن من أكبر الكبائر أن يلعن الرجل والديه قيل يا رسول الله كيف يلعن الرجل والديه قال يسب الرجل يسب أبا الرجل فيسب أباه ويسب أمه فيسب أمه عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص may Allah be pleased with him and his father narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said it is one of the gravest sins to curse one's parents. He was asked, O Prophet of Allah, can a man ever curse his own parents? And that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Yeah, when he curses the father of somebody else, who in return curses the former's father. And then he curses the mother of somebody else, who in return curses his mother. This narration is agreed upon its authenticity. In another narration, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, one of the major sins is to curse one's parents. Then the Prophet ﷺ was asked, how can a man curse his own parents? He said, peace be upon him, when somebody curses the parents of another man who in return curses the former's father. And when someone curses the mother of another man who in return abuses or curses his mother. This is a sound hadith. And the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith means to block all the means of being undutiful to one's parents. The person may be very kind, showing a great deal of servitude to his parents. And he's taking care of them to the best of his ability. And they love him so much. They pray for him. They admire him. But outside, at work, at school, with his colleagues, or whenever he picks up a fight, whenever he's driving his car, and he has some friction with somebody else, so they fight verbally. So he says, you son of such and such. 
Okay, in this case, do you think that the other guy would remain quiet and say, may God forgive you? I will very few would do that. But in today's world, I don't think so. Uh, somebody curses somebody's father, abuses somebody's mother, uh, insults somebody's parents, he's not going to simply take it quietly. Rather, you cursed his father, he's going to curse your father and grandfather, your mother and grandmother, and the whole family. So, basically, this person cursed your whole family because you started it. You cursed his father. He abused his mother. How often do we hear that in movies, in series, on talk shows, uh, while playing games, youth, high school kids, uh, even middle school kids now, and college, people take it very lightly. To the point that I meet some college students, I pass by them. Whenever they're joking with each other, they're having fun, they're smoking and chit-chatting, uh, you know, it's like a compliment. Oh, you're son of such and such. So the other guy, you too, son of such and such. Maybe the parents are innocent parents somewhere and have no clue what their son is doing. Maybe they are even dead and they're being cursed, they're being insulted, sometimes being insulted with the act of fahisha or zina. There is a particular insult when the person says you're son of such and such, that means that your mother uh, bore you and gave birth to you illegitimately simply as a result of an illicit relationship. One word. This one word means that your mother is an adulteress. In Islam, this is not taken lightly. This is perceived as not just a major sin. In the hadith, in the other narration, in min akbar al-kaba'ir. One of the gravest sins, one of the most heinous sins, is when you curse your parents. Now we know that a person does not necessarily have to tell his father uh, to tell him off or to curse his mother or to abuse his parents in order to be cursed because he's done something bad. No. Even if he's super nice to them, but outside he deals with people as they do so that he curses his father and mother and so on, this is perceived as one of the gravest sins. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Muhammad from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum ya sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the program. Okay, thank you sir. Thank you sir. We thank you very, very, very much. Uh, you are trying to uh, help the Islam. May God guide you and give uh, you long life. And you too. Thank you. And uh, give the ummah more people like you. And better than and, all uh, of my us, question is, uh, Hello, my question is, it is permissible for a married woman to do adoption after delivery a four months old baby. Okay. Yeah, I'm Abortion, abortion, to do an abortion after delivering a four month baby. Could you tell me the reason, Muhammad, please? The reason because of the woman says she afraid to feed the baby, blah, 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 I understand. But we say, let me ask this question before anything. Okay, Jazakallah Khairan. Got your question, Muhammad. Thank you. Abortion in Islam is equivalent to killing. Whether you kill an adult, whether he killed the fetus in the womb of his mother, it is all forbidden. And Islam was the very first religion to legislate the prohibition of abortion, uh, whether uh, before four months or after four months. There are some very limited conditions during which abortion becomes legitimate, when there is a serious life threat to the mother who's bearing the child. So the physician says, if you continue Bearing the child, you may die. And there is a great possibility that we will lose you. In this case, no. Let's lose the child and abort the baby. 
But other than that, when the family say, oh my God, I have three kids already and they're giving me a hard time. I'm not ready for a fourth one. It's not up to you to take the life of an innocent child because yes, he's been formed in the womb of the mother before or after. So this is a living being. It is not permissible. In the Quran, Allah the Almighty says about those who used to kill their daughters once they're born um, because of the same reason, they, Allah the Almighty says, وَإِذَا الْمَوْءُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ Allah the Almighty addressed this issue in the Quran many times, which shows this is not an easy sin. This is killing. And both parents and the doctor who is doing the abortion are blameworthy. And there will be a dia, the blood money, and a compensation. It's a major sin. Please do not do that. Only when the physician says it is causing a life threat to the mother, now we can abort the baby. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sister Juwairiya from Uganda. Thank you for the program, Sheikh. May Allah reward you. Amen. I have two questions, Sheikh. Mm-hmm. The first question is about my father. One of my father is claiming that we talked something bad about him, and he is very angry, very angry. And, and he says he wants us to apologize. As we we don't know what we did, and we 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 know in our hearts that we did nothing to him, nothing at all. So, if I don't apologize to him, am I accounted like I'm a bad person to my kinship? Because I know I did not do anything, but for him he says I did something, and which I don't know. So I I don't know about that. I don't know if I don't do it, I'm doing something haram. Sister Juwaria, you said he's one of your brothers, right? My, my, yeah, a brother to my father. Brother to your father, okay. So he's your brother from your father's side. He's, he's on my father's side. Yeah, regardless, he is your brother. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll yes. tell you what I would do if I were in your position. If one of my brothers said I'm upset, okay, I hope you listen to me. If one of my friends or one of my brothers says, I'm upset with you because of something bad you did and you need to apologize. I would say immediately, I do apologize. If that is the only thing which will reconcile between us, I would take it. I would say it, no big deal. I would not make a big deal out of it. Then when we reconcile, say, I would be more than happy if you can just explain to me what wrong did I do in order to avoid it in the future. We need to look at the bigger picture. The picture or the problem is not that I do not think I did something bad and he believes I did something bad. Maybe somebody in between said that we once were talking and your sister said whatever. So we need to know what is the cause of this affliction in order to eliminate it. If I say to this person, initially and without even knowing what I did, I do apologize. My, you're my beloved brother, and I would not lose you for anything in this life. Okay, that breaks the ice. It removes all the barriers. And the worst barrier is a psychological barrier. Something in his mind right now is telling him that you abused him and he need to apologize. My apologies, no problem. Next, what was wrong? Okay, that would lift the fog. Thank you. Sister Juwairiya, as the Prophet ﷺ said, the best of the two opponents, when two brothers, two sisters, two friends break up, the best of them is the one who takes the initiative and begins reconciling simply by saying, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Aisha from the case A. Salam. My friend says that he wants to pray before going to bed. That is Dr. Aisha. And again, she wants to wake up at night and pray Kiyama Maid. Now she's asking me, is it okay to do that? Or, and she had that if you already pray with you before sleeping, then you should not pray another prayer. Okay. Do you have and any other questions? Person, my sister had a problem with my brother, my stepbrother. Mm-hmm. 
So this, that is some um, few days before Ramadan. Mm. And you say you should not start fasting if you have anything between you and any of your relatives. Now I called my sister and I told her that she should reconcile with my step with my step brother. So my sister called my father and they went home to resolve this issue. But when my father called this step brother, he refused to come so that they can settle this matter. The brother refused to come. So they did not solve anything. Now my sister said, she, I'm not in the, I'm, I'm, I'm in Kese, but they are in Kenya. She told me, what now should I do? Ramadan is approaching. I say now, what you should, should do, just say salam alaikum to him. If he, if he answered, it's okay. If he does, then just to greet him. Okay. But she, she, she called me back and said, he's still not responding to his salam. Now, is she still accountable for that? Whatever happened between them. Oh, thank you, Sister Aisha. Okay. My brother refused to come for that because of this. Okay. Barakallahu fiki. Uh, thank you, Sister Aisha. Jazakillahu khairan. I will begin with your second question that your sister have done uh, what she can do. And she's not blameworthy afterward. But she will continue give him the salam. If he doesn't answer, this is exactly as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. He said, continue upholding their ties even if they do not, even if they sever your ties. Continue to do what you think is good, even if they're not doing so, if they're doing the opposite. And she's not blameworthy anymore. Would you guess your first question, that praying which, then going to sleep and getting up before Fajr to pray, at a hajjud, all night prayer, do you have to pray which again? No. Have you prayed which once? whether in the beginning or halfway, midnight, then you are not supposed to pray another witch, even if you pray afterward. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, said in the hadith, one should not pray two witch in the same night. لا وطراني في ليلة. And that is simply because if you pray two witch, that means it will be even. So you will have to pray witch again. So only once you pray witch at night. And it is still permissible if you decided to pray like you got up and you decided to pray before Fajr, it is permissible to pray voluntary prayers as much as you want. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Haritu from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum, Haritu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Welcome to the program. Wa alaikum assalam. I have. Yes, I have a question to ask you. Mm -hmm. Um, if, uh, how about if a married woman or a, ma a married man committed a dinner and then after he or she realized that doing dinner is hard, what is the solution to this program? Hi. But sister, from the beginning, don't you think that adultery is haram? You mean in your question that after a married couple, um, a man or a woman committed adultery. They realize that it is haram, like surprise, surprise. They just figured out that ma adultery is haram. Of course, uh, every sane person knows that even without knowing the religious ruling, out of honesty, you're already married. So establishing an illicit relationship with somebody else while you're married, whether it is the husband or the wife, is a grave sin, right? But in this case, the punishment in Islam is very severe, way severer than if the person was unmarried. And when we say unmarried or a single or a bachelor, it means have not been married before. Because the sin is the same if the person is currently married or was married before, but currently is a bachelor. Okay? Nowadays, we don't have an Islamic law. Uh, in, in, in most of the states. So what am I supposed to do in order to get rid of the sin? Do not confess the sin to no one. Keep it between you and Allah and make sincere tawbah. Try to be pious and chaste to the best of your ability. Sever all your relations with people who 
assisted you or led you to commit the sin. Avoid that completely. Making sincere tawbah, even if the person had committed adultery, would expiate the sin, provided it is sincere. In Surah al furqan Allah the Almighty says, وَلَا يَزْنُونَ The ayah begins with, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَا يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا No matter how bad is the sin, including adultery, if the person repented sincerely, then the sin will be waived. Not only waived, if the person taba wa amana, a number 70, taba, repented, amana, believed, amila amalan saliha, followed the evil deed with good deeds, started doing good righteous deeds, read as much Quran as you can, give any charity as much as you can, fast voluntary fasting, pray at night, make sure you attend the prayer on time, lower your gaze, line up, do your best to be righteous. For them, أُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Not only that Allah will forgive them their sins, but will convert their bad deeds into good deeds in a state. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا And listen, not only that, but Allah is all forgiving the most merciful. وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابَ For them, their tawbah is definitely accepted. But that is between the sinner and Allah to really show that he or she is sincere in their repentance. My dear beloved brothers and sisters, we have just come to the end of today's program and we consumed all the time that is allowed for us to be continued insha'Allah next week. Until then I leave you all in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. Allah our God is the greatest, the one and only glory to him. He only humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. Rasulullah, Habib Allah.